I love you. It'll pass. In the final scene of Fleabag, the title character parts ways with the man she loves, her so-called hot priest. But even more significantly, she breaks up with us. It wasn't very hard. This is The Takeaway, brought to you by The Take, where we break down the endings of your favorite films and TV shows to get at the deeper meanings and messages they leave us with. In this episode, we're looking at Fleabag's series finale, which continues to evoke a lot of profound feelings and questions in viewers. Throughout the series, Phoebe Waller-Bridge's snarky, self-absorbed protagonist has treated the camera like her confidant, regularly breaking the fourth wall to joke with us about her life. The next man who walks in here is getting ridden to death. Dad! Not ideal. This is Fleabag's way of avoiding her life, hiding its raw tragedies behind a facade of snarky humor and emotional detachment. He hates being alone in a room with me. But the final shot of the show finds Fleabag turning to the camera one last time, then turning away. She doesn't need us anymore. So what does it really mean to leave behind the imaginary camera in your mind? Here's the takeaway of Fleabag. Do you see them a lot? Oh, they're, <laughs> they're always there. They're, they're always there. As a character, Fleabag has been known to break the rules. And that also goes for the unspoken rules of television. You are later. Uh, yes, yes, please, yes, yes. Fleabag spends much of her time talking directly to camera, in a similar format to Phoebe Waller-Bridge's original stage play, where Fleabag's life is presented as a monologue delivered directly to the audience, who eventually realize that it's all an act. As Waller-Bridge explained to Vulture, she had to keep making the audience laugh. She's trying to keep up the jokes, but the tragedy starts revealing itself through the story. She's dead now. She accidentally killed herself. And the TV adaptation retains that theatrical spirit. Fleabag feels unusually intimate and alive, as though we're right there in the room with the protagonist, while her observational aside slowly reveal clues about the deep inner pain they're hiding. And you feel great. You're not even thinking about you don't even think about. The format also calls attention to how so many of us treat our own lives like a performance, filtered and exaggerated for an audience's approval. It was more about her control of telling the story, so everything the audience knew about the world that she was describing was seen completely through her prism. Even the show's title tells us how we're meant to see the central character. We don't actually know her real name. We simply know her as Fleabag, unflattering British slang for a dirty or unkempt person. Let's do flash poo and prep. Christ, did you wash your hands? Of course not. Oh my God, you are disgusting. As Waller-Bridge has said, Fleabag presents herself with nice hair, lipstick, coat. Oh God, he can't believe how attractive I am. She looks like she's got stuff together and yet her name betrays the subtext of her. I'm a greedy, perverted, selfish, apathetic, cynical, depraved, morally bankrupt woman who can't even call herself a feminist. Confiding in the audience, the people behind that fourth wall she keeps breaking is Fleabag's only true outlet for her self-doubts. She even admits to her therapist that she sees us as her friends. I have friends. Oh, so you do have someone to talk to. Yeah. But while we, the unreal viewers in her head, can't judge her, we're also not actually there to support her either, and it becomes clear she's hiding behind her jokes and her imaginary friends to ignore her feelings. It would be good not to make jokes in here. Oh, I don't know if I can do that. <laughs> When Fleabag meets the priest in the second season, he succeeds in getting her to open up, and the very format of the show begins to break down. What was that? What? He just went somewhere. Unlike anyone else Fleabag has met, the priest actually sees what she's doing. He sees us. When the priest calls her out on her inner camera, That thing that you're doing, it's like you disappear. The symbolism is that he notices that she's pulling back and running away from true intimacy, instead escaping into emotional detachment and reducing her life to fodder for jokes in her secret TV show. <laughs> <laughs> He's a bit annoying, actually. What is that? Getting closer to a real person makes it difficult for Fleabag to maintain this fourth wall, the one she's put up between the life she performs for others and this private, internal life we've been privy to. His beautiful neck. What? What? You just said his beautiful neck. 
In one of the season's key scenes, Fleabag confesses her fears and herself to the priest, telling him things she's only ever shared with us. I just think I want someone to tell me how to live my life, Father, because so far I think I've been getting it wrong. And once she finds this real intimacy, suddenly we're the ones on the outside. Crucially, after opening up like this, Fleabag starts to accept that she's not this quippy, surface-level monster she's been pretending to be, and she realizes that the other people in her life don't see her as one either. The only person I'd run for an airport for is you. Once Fleabag stops seeing herself as, well, a Fleabag, that's where the show ends. Wallerbridge has often talked about Fleabag's desperate need to say the thing you shouldn't say. I sometimes worry that I wouldn't be such a feminist if I had bigger tits." Fleabag spends most of the series' run saying those things only to us, her imaginary audience, trying to shock us or make us laugh, to distract from the true tragedy of her life. Dad books us boob appointments once a year to make sure our tits don't turn on us like moms did. It's a bit of a hassle, but at the end of the day, it's nice to be touched. But from her cathartic unburdening in the confessional booth to the moment she confesses her true feelings for the priest, I love you. Fleabag is finally able to say those unsayable things to herself. She's ready to let go of her act, and abandon the snark and the self-loathing that are making her feel so lost and lonely. In the end, she's leaving behind not just the audience, but also her former self. That's the very reason why they put rubbers on the end of pencils. Because people make mistakes. Like this character, we so often attempt to detach from and exert control over our own stories, but it's only when we stop that we find the peace of accepting who we really are. I think you know how to love better than any of us. That's why you find it all so painful. Just a girl with no friends and an empty heart. By your own description. We learn that Fleabag hasn't always been this way. Not born said. Some people are. You wouldn't. In fact, the entire show is about her dealing with her grief over two traumatic losses. I just want to cry all the time. Or rather, not dealing with that grief. When we first meet Fleabag, we learn that she lost her mother to a long battle with cancer, and that her father has all but shut her out. Dad's way of coping with two motherless daughters was to buy us tickets to feminist lectures, start f***ing our godmother and eventually stop calling. She's also lost her best friend and confidant, Boo. I've always been insecure about my face. You know that. I know. You shouldn't. We eventually learn that she even feels responsible for Boo's death, because Fleabag sleeping with Boo's boyfriend is what led to Boo's fatal accident. I'm gonna hurt myself, I'm gonna get hit by a bike, and then hurt my finger, and then he's gonna have to come and see me in hospital. We really sorry for what he did. Without the only people in her life she might have talked to about her grief and guilt, Fleabag has no healthy way to process any of it. She adopts a cynical worldview that becomes a bulwark against her grief, resists anything that might challenge it, Don't make me an optimist, you will ruin my life! and pushes everyone remaining in her life away. We often talk about the five stages of grief, and may even assume there are right or wrong ways to grieve. I don't know how you're waiting. Yet studies have proven that the five stages are hardly universal. Wow, you look… have you had your eyebrows done? One of the ways that Fleabag copes with grief is through her hypersexuality. I spent most of my adult life using sex to deflect from the screaming void inside my empty heart. But of course, whatever pleasure she gets from sex doesn't last. And Fleabag herself admits that she's always trying to get something else out of it. I'm not obsessed with sex. I just can't stop thinking about it. The performance of it. Not so much the feeling of it. As Waller-Bridge explained, that line, which appears in her original stage play, is the key to understanding Fleabag. It's not necessarily about her going out and having millions of orgasms, she told Vulture. It was really that she knows that she needs it for validation, but she can't admit that it comes from that place. The moment you realize someone wants your body. But rather than it making her feel better, sex just ends up making her lonelier and bringing her even more misery. Sex didn't bring anything… good. 
When sex doesn't work, Fleabag retreats behind humor. Humor can be effective in dealing with grief. Psychologists traditionally classify it as a mature defense mechanism. But for Fleabag, it's near pathological. She reverts to humor in every situation. Stop making jokes. Sorry, I can't help it. You can. She even allows her humor to derail her most intimate relationships. Like when she plays a prank on her boyfriend Harry, then laughs at his very real anxiety attack. That was horrible. It was a surprise. I know. Thank you. It's fine. The things she uses to get over her problems and her loneliness only end up exacerbating them. And Fleabag gets to the point where these unhealthy coping mechanisms for her grief become integral to her very idea of herself. Slots! Yes? This is a love story. Throughout the show, we see Fleabag confront her debased idea of herself and her belief that she's unable to grow. When we meet her, she seems to view everything in her life as inevitable and predictable, as though it were already scripted. You don't always know what I'm going to say, okay? Sorry. Out of... Out of her when she's driving. Me while I'm driving. But the priest does the impossible for Fleabag. He surprises her. No one's asked me a question in 45 minutes. So what do you do? He intrudes upon her idea of herself as broken and alone, and he shows her genuine interest and care from the moment they meet. Fleabag's desire for the priest, as a symbol of God... Do you really want to f the priest, or do you want to f God? Can you f God? also on some level represents her desire for total intimacy, to feel completely loved and accepted in the way that she can't love or accept herself. When she confesses her desire to be told exactly what to do and how to behave, I want someone to tell me what to believe in, who to vote for, and who to love, and how to tell them. We see that she longs for certainty and meaning to fill her void. Initially, though, instead of accepting the olive branch of love and acceptance the world has offered her in the form of the priest, Fleabag retreats into her old habits. She puts up walls. You're just trying to get to know me. Well, I don't want that. She jokes to cover up her deeper feelings. Are you in love with him? <laughs> Why do you find that funny? And rather than examining those feelings, she obsesses over having sex with him. I want to f a priest. Catholic? Yes. Throwing herself into the taboo of it all. We're not going to have sex. <laughs> I know that's what you think you want from me, but it's not. It won't bring any good. Of course, Fleabag does have sex with the priest, but this time it's different. Just like the priest warned her, it isn't just about sex for either of them. I can't have sex with you because I'll fall in love with you. The consequences aren't the same either. Knowing how much she's already hurt others and given her low opinion of herself, she accepts it as inevitable that her having sex with the priest will ruin his life. I won't burst into flames, but my life will be We're gonna have sex. But the priest's life isn't destroyed. Yes, he finds himself confused. Oh, I don't know what this feeling is. <sighs> is it God or is it me? I don't know. Yet, ultimately, he still believes in what matters to him. It's God, isn't it? Yeah. And although she is heartbroken to lose him, she's also reassured that she, in fact, doesn't always ruin everything. And that maybe the world isn't so predictable as she thought. I love you too. We even see a hint that this story isn't necessarily over. The priest has told us repeatedly that he's terrified of foxes who have tormented him for years. I woke up just feeling a bit weird, like there might be a fox about. And notably, they seem to appear whenever his faith is being tested. Do you ever have doubts? Yes, of course, every day. Is oh, it's a fox! In the surreal final scene, a fox suddenly appears, and Fleabag sends it after him. He went that way. We're left to understand that the priest will be followed by his doubts until he finally makes peace with them. But for this story, it doesn't really matter if that means he'll find his way back to her. Because Fleabag is content. Her growth outweighs the uncertainty. Ultimately, Fleabag is a love story, even if it ends in heartbreak. It's about how a damaged, self-loathing woman relearns how to love, which in turn gives her hope. When you find somebody that you love, it feels like hope. 
Although it's about a woman whose most intimate relationship is with us, her imaginary friends, Fleabag centers on human connection. I want to move back home. I want to hug my wife. As Waller Bridge has explained, in the first season, Fleabag couldn't love because she'd been so burnt by love. I think that's what was so moving about the response, is that people really do want to love each other and watch shows about love. So it turns out it's quite hard to come up with something original to say about love. But I've had a go. Through many of the show's characters, we see how this paradox is inside everyone. We're all dying to share what we're feeling inside, but so afraid to reveal it to each other. You know, everyone feels like this is a little bit, and they're just not talking about it. Or I am completely it's often framed as shameful to ask for or actively seek attention. But Fleabag shows how important it is to listen to our desire to be seen. And that's the only really thing about getting older is that people don't flirt with you anymore. So grab the night by its nipples and go and flirt with someone. For a while, we fulfill this desire for Fleabag, until she finally finds other people who see her, the real her, and she no longer needs us around. Like the end of her romance with the priest, her breakup from us leaves her more whole than she began. And it leaves us with a challenge to find somewhere new to put our love. All the love I have for her, I don't know where to put it now. It's got to go somewhere. So, what did you think of Fleabag's ending? Let us know in the comments, and be sure to subscribe to the Amazon Prime video channel.